So I realized that in previous videos, I've been talking a lot about biological problems, but not really giving a specific example. And I think I got a comment asking if I can show a problem that I could solve computationally. So I thought, yeah, I could show you that and we can all learn together. So in today's video, I'll be taking you through a lab assignment from a class that was a bioengineering computational biology class that I took at Berkeley. And I chose this one specifically because I think it isn't too difficult. Ugh, not that difficult. What a show off. Like you don't really need to code that much to solve this problem. And I actually think it's kind of fun to think about and you don't really need that many tools to do this assignment. So with very few tools and just a little bit of base knowledge, you can actually learn quite a bit from this assignment. I hope I can show you the motivation behind a computational biology problem, make it fun, and hopefully you learn something out of this video. Also too, I hope that this video becomes literally the most fun explanation of this computational biology problem that you'll ever hear because when a professor starts teaching you this, it's all downhill from here. I'm just kidding. Also, you really need to subscribe because I had to review my homework assignment in order to make this video. And we all know I don't even put that much thought into the assignment when I'm doing the actual assignment itself. Also, I'm out here sweating buckets because I have to close all the doors in this room to get the best audio for this video. And you're probably thinking, well, Megan, why can't you turn on the AC in your house? And yeah, that's a good Good point. Well, so the tools that you're going to need to do this lab assignment is very few. The first is installing a package called Vienna Sausage. Good one, Megan. LMAO, just kidding. You're going to need to install a package called Vienna RNA. And if you don't know what a package is, a package pretty much means that all the work has been done for you. All you need to do is know how to use the package and apply it to your own problem. Here's some steps that you could follow that I used. Hopefully they still work. You're also going to need this paper. Uh, you could read it if you want, but reading, I mean, who does that anymore? Or you can continue watching the rest of this video where I'll give you a very ghetto remix version of what the paper is essentially trying to say anyways. And then optional is installing Jupyter Notebook. And if you don't know what Jupyter Notebook is, never heard of it. Jupyter spelled with a Y, not an I. Jupyter Notebook is pretty much a notebook for Python. It's pretty much just a pretty way to write your Python code in a notebook. And the last thing you're going to need is some basic understanding of Harry Potter in order to understand my analogies. But as usual, that's extra credit. <sighs> okay, cool. If you have all of those tools, then it's science time. So I'm assuming you already know what RNA is or else you wouldn't be watching this video. But in case you forgot, RNA stands for Rough Nuts Alliance, Rotatable Nice Alien, Republic of nice Asians. So if you're new to this channel, I was joking in that last part. RNA, as we all know, stands for ribonucleic acid. RNA is basically this badass string of letters that does badass things. They're like the Matt Damons of biology. But what's important to know about them is the way that they base pair. In other words, what letters in their string of letters bind to each other. So a quick refresher, A binds to U. Way to remember this is ass to underwear. C binds to G crunchy guavas. But how these base pairing rules are relevant to today's video is that the RNA can base pair internally. In other words, it can fold in on itself to create this folded structure. Pretty cool, right? Megan, tell me more. So there's this thing called a riboswitch and a riboswitch is basically this special type of folded RNA structure. So what makes it special? What makes it special is that this riboswitch can serve as a logic gate. And what is a logic gate? Basically a logic gate is if a certain condition is met, then something happens. Imagine there's Hogwarts and there's a gate in front of Hogwarts that's closed. A witch or wizard comes by the gate and if they have a key, then they can enter Hogwarts. If they don't have a key, then they can't enter Hogwarts. They'll just remain a muggle and think back to when they were 11 years old and they waited in front of the house in front of the mailbox for days on end looking for their magical letter to say that they were some magical human being, but it never came. The condition is whether or not they have a key and the thing that happens is their ability to enter Hogwarts. Now a riboswitch is like a logic gate in that the condition that has to be met is whether or not there's a nearby DNA sequence. And the stuff that happens when that condition is met is that the riboswitch cuts itself or self cleaves. So a riboswitch is like your emo friend that needs another friend in order to cut itself kind of dark. Okay, Megan, um, that's cool, but 
I don't really give a shit. Like, why would I care if an RNA would be able to cut itself? All I want to do is stay home during quarantine, watch Netflix, drink boba, and not think about self-cleaving folded RNA riboswitches. So the purpose of these riboswitches is actually pretty cool. If each of the riboswitches serve as a logic gate, then imagine if you strung together many logic gates or many ripo switches and create this overall genetic circuit. Not only would you be able to control certain gene expression, but also detect the presence of a nucleic acid in solution. For example, if you have a ripo switch and you know that the ripo switch is there, and then later in time you see that the ripo switch cleaved itself, then you know that there's a certain DNA sequence in solution that led to the self cleavage of that ripo switch. If you look for the consequence or the then effect, then you'll be able to identify whether or not the if that caused that then was there. And that's pretty cool. I'm going to be talking about four types of logic gates for the rest of this video, and they're pretty simple. We get it. Everything is easy for you. The first is called the yes gate. Do you hold the spell to open the gates of Hogwarts? Then yes, you can come in. If you don't, you remain a muggle. In terms of the riboswitch, do you have a nearby DNA sequence that can bind to a specific part of the riboswitch? If yes, then the riboswitch will self-cleave. More technically, here's what it looks like. So that blue region is the part of the riboswitch sequence that the nearby DNA sequence will bind to specifically. As that nearby sequence binds to that blue region, it will force the rest of the RNA sequence to rearrange itself and allow those red regions to align and match up. Then self-cleavage happens. The second gate is called the not gate. And the not gate is a little bit different than the yes gate. Now imagine the gate to Hogwarts automatically being open. The default is that you don't need a key to enter. You, Harry Potter or Draco Malfoy, whatever character you want to be, you can automatically walk inside Hogwarts without a key or spell. Now imagine that now Voldemort comes along and closes the gate. The presence of Voldemort makes you not able to enter the gate of Hogwarts. Now let's draw the analogy back to the Ribo switch. By default, without the presence of another nearby specific matching DNA sequence, the Ribo switch automatically self cleaves. However, in the presence of a matching DNA sequence, the Ribo switch is unable to self cleave. Referring back to the blue and red regions, by default, the red regions are automatically aligned. However, when the nearby DNA sequence comes and binds to that blue region of the riboswitch, the rest of the RNA structure is forced to rearrange itself and those RNA regions are no longer aligned or matched up. This brings me to the third logic gate, the AND gate. Now imagine you're about to go fight off a horcrux or find a horcrux. Now you need two sidekicks, Ron and Hermione. The riboswitch now has two blue regions because it needs two DNA sequences, each to bind to each of the respective blue regions in order for the RNA structure to rearrange itself and the red regions to align and match up. One DNA sequence isn't good enough and just the other DNA sequence also isn't good enough. You need both sidekicks, Ron and Hermione to be present in order for the riboswitch to self-cleave. And that's why this is called an AND gate. Let's move on to the fourth and last logic gate I'll be talking about today, the OR gate. So now imagine you're off to complete some sort of minor task. You have to go fight off some giants in the forbidden forest. You don't really need both sidekicks. Like you don't need both Ron and Hermione in order to fight off the giants. You could maybe use one or the other. And if both are available, that's cool too. You could take both. I mean, if you had a preference, you would probably choose Hermione because Ron is kind of useless, but you could just take Ron if Hermione had to go and study or something. So it's called the OR gate because you can have one DNA sequence present or the other DNA sequence present, or you can have both present in order for the red regions to align, match up, and for the riboswitch to eventually self-cleave. One. <laughs> Two. <laughs> Gets me riding so hopefully by now you have some sort of baseline scientific knowledge of what's going on in this paper and how we're going to bring that understanding to solve the first part of this week's lab assignment. So the first part of this lab assignment is seeing if 
with this Vienna sausage, <coughs> excuse me, Vienna RNA package, if we can mimic and recreate the RNA folded structures that are presented in this paper. Are the RNA folded structures presented in this paper reproducible? With our own tools, can we recreate what the authors in this paper accomplished? And the most important thing about this package is that we're gonna be calling the function RNA fold in the rest of this assignment. Okay, so did you install Jupyter Notebook? It's okay if you didn't, you don't really need it. All you need is your terminal. Now, the second thing we're going to need to do is grab the RNA sequences that the paper used. The third thing we're going to do is now the exciting part. We're going to call the function RNA fold that the Vienna package has. Now you could either call this function through your terminal, which is pretty simple, or you could write a function in Jupyter Notebook that will call this same function. So now the fourth step, if you did decide to write your function in Jupyter Notebook is to just call it. Now, if you're just gonna use your terminal to call the function, then you could just ignore this step. Now, if you are using your terminal after calling the function from your command line, the folded RNA structure image will be saved somewhere in some directory in your laptop. Now, if you're using your Jupyter Notebook to call the function RNA fold, then you could also write this to display the image of the folded RNA structure in your Jupyter notebook. And now the sixth and final thing we need to do is look at the folded RNA structures that we were able to generate and compare them to the ones presented in the paper. Are they the same? Do they match up? How different are they? Are the base pairs aligned in the same way that's presented in the paper? And now you're going to repeat these steps for the rest of the different logic gates that we have. The only thing you're going to need to change is the input sequence corresponding to the different logic gates presented in the paper. So here's a few images of what these four logic gates might look like. The first is yes. <laughs> Not Oh yes, oh yes, daddy. And they see me trolling, they hate it, trolling and trying to get me riding dirty, trying to get me riding dirty. Or they might remind you of now the second part of this assignment is pretty interesting actually and what it is is simulating binding in other words what do the rna folded structures look like if those matching nearby dna sequences were to bind to the blue regions of our riboswitches so how are we going to go about doing that huh? what probably every professor feels like when they ask a classic question and literally no one answers. The answer is finding a way to make sure those blue regions are reserved. Or in other words, when the RNA sequence folds in on itself, those blue regions are unable to bind within that RNA structure. Those spots are reserved for binding to the sidekick DNA sequence. All right, cool. Now that we have that idea down, how are we gonna block off those specific blue regions on our RNA sequence? Well, in our function RNA fold that we called earlier, you can specify what regions that you wanna reserve, or in other words, block off. So now we're gonna modify RNA fold to RNA fold dash C. If you enter that in your terminal, you'll see that a bunch of different options come up. Now, the dot or the period means that, okay, this spot or this specific nucleotide is able to bind. And the X tells us, stop, we can't bind that specific nucleotide to another nucleotide within our own RNA sequence because we need to reserve it. And it's super simple. All we have to do is call RNA fold dash C, enter the sequence that we're working with, and then below that, enter another sequence. But this time that sequence won't be a string of letters. It'll be a string of periods and Xs. Period corresponding to go ahead and bind and X corresponding to stop this specific nucleotide is reserved for the nearby DNA sequence that it's supposed to bind to and now you can go ahead and practice this on your own but this is what it looks like the yes gate they see me trolling they hate it the not gate gets me riding dirty gets me riding dirty the and gate and the or gate I feel super stupid doing those hand motions right now because I have to go and add those photos in later when I edit. So doing this, it's like, what am I even pointing to right now? Gets me right All right, my dudes. 
That's all I got for today's video. I hope this was fun for you. I hope you learned a little bit. Um, if you didn't learn, that's okay too. I hope you were entertained. As usual, let me know in the comment section below how you're doing. If this video inspired you to go and try this lab assignment, which you can totally do because all of the resources are open source and available, that's awesome. If you, if you don't wanna do the assignment, that's cool too. I respect that. You probably have better things to do, like plan your next TikTok. Yeah, I'll, drop in the comment section below what, what you've been watching on Netflix. I'm actually more curious what you watch on Netflix then whether or not you enjoyed this video. Stay safe, stay edgy. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, support my dream to become a rising YouTube star. And I'll see you very soon.